First of all, I bring you greetings, as I always do, from our fellow Episcopalians in almost 100 congregations, schools, and special ministries from Jensen Beach, just to the north of us here. You're, you're almost at the border between here and the land of Mordor. <laughs> all the way down to Key West and as far west as Clewiston. So we come from many countries, we speak many languages, and we embody many cultures. But as we said at the beginning of this liturgy, we are united in one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And since this is my first visit to you on a Sunday since before the pandemic, it's been three years since I've been here, I think, on a Sunday morning, I want to uh, say a couple of things before I preach my three-hour sermon. <laughs> I got a lot to make up for having not been here for three years. The first thing I want to do is pay um, both a personal and an official uh, uh, act of gratitude to uh, your former rector, Father Todd and Darla, uh, who have retired from their ministry here. Uh, as I said in the message that was read at his uh, farewell celebration, to which unfortunately I was not able to be uh, uh, able to come, um, he has been a remarkable and valued colleague and friend to me and Darla to my wife, Kate, um, from before I even came here. He was part of the search committee and was a, a great encouragement uh, to me. And I have uh, not just valued all that he has done for you and with you, uh, he has also been uh, a real support and help to me over the years, full of wisdom and thoughtfulness, faithfulness and grace. Um, and so I want to uh, thank him even in his absence and uh, mark uh, what was a remarkable tenure as the rector of this parish. But I want also to um, acknowledge and to thank the ongoing leadership of the parish, Father Christian, Mother Patsy, the vestry, the cohorts of lay leaders in the congregation, all of those who were involved in making the ministry of this church happen every day. And I want to thank you for, for all that you're doing, not just since Father Todd left, but all that you have done to sustain the ministry and life of this community through the pandemic. So help me by thanking all of those who have made this happen. And, and I expect that there will be six-week-long cruise tickets in, um, in, in Father Christian's and Mother Patsy's uh, pigeonholes sometime soon as a practical expression of your gratitude to them for all that they have done. Let me know. All right. I also want to congratulate all of those who are being confirmed and received and who are renewing your baptismal covenant today. Um, there are 3,000 of them. The one, there's some inside, there's some outside. Um, uh, it's, it's been a while since I've been here, so we've, we've got a lot to do this morning. Um, but it's a wonderful sign of hope and encouragement. Your commitment is, of course, important to you, but it's important to this whole community. So thank you for making this commitment today, for renewing your commitments, and for placing yourselves at the disposal of the church for the church's business in following and preaching the gospel. And thank you to all of those who prepared uh, our candidates today for this liturgy. In so many images of Pentecost, I, I want also to say this too, I, please, I know you do this because you're a community of prayer, but please continue to pray for your clergy, for your leadership, for all of those who exercise ministry here. It's so important. Um, 
We may sometimes think that our prayers don't do very much, but those of us who are prayed for on a regular basis know that, know that. And so please continue to pray for your parish leadership, and please know that I pray for you and give thanks to God for your ministry every day. You're a real encouragement to me. So, are you timing this? Yeah. Thank you. So, just, when we get to two and a half hours, give me a, just give me a warning, all right? <laughs> You're laughing now. You won't be laughing in two and a half hours. <laughs> It wasn't unusual for you to preach three-hour sermons in Madagascar, was it, Father? Exactly, you see. In so many images of Pentecost, um, in addition to the disciples with little flames over their heads, we see the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, in their midst. In the Byzantine iconographic tradition, she is inevitably there. And she is in all of these images, like the one by Titian on the front cover of your bulletin. Look on the front cover of your bulletin. We've provided this for you this morning at huge cost. We were gonna have the painting brought, but they said they wouldn't lend it to us. But if you see, there she is, right in the middle of the disciples. This is, this is such a common image. This is the classic way of, of describing in painting the, the, the occasion of Pentecost with the mother of God right there in the midst of everything. And we know that she was there because in the opening verses of the Acts of the Apostles, we read that she and other women were with the disciples after the ascension in those early days of this emerging community of the followers of Jesus. And when Pentecost came, they were all together. So, what a gift it is for you that your patron saint is the one who is in the midst of the church as the church is being revealed to the world for its mission and work. Because without understanding the Blessed Virgin Mary, we're not going to understand the true meaning of Pentecost because Pentecost just doesn't come out of nowhere. The Holy Spirit just does not come out of nowhere. The Holy Spirit may blow where it wills and all of that, but it doesn't come from any old place. It comes from God because it is God and it's only by understanding how the Virgin Mary is a part of this story that we're going to understand the true significance of what we are celebrating today. So in order to understand this, of course, we're going to have to look back a little bit. We're going to have to look back a little bit. And we need to remember one important biblical factoid. And that is that the Gospel of St. Luke and the Acts of the Apostles were written by the same person. And that means that the Gospel of St. Luke and the Acts of the Apostles don't form two separate stories. They form one story in, as it were, two volumes. And it's hard to read the Gospel of St. Luke without keeping the Acts of the Apostles in mind, and it's hard to read the Acts of the Apostles without remembering back to what St. Luke says in his Gospel. And indeed, there are some who think that St. Luke wrote the Acts of the Apostles first and then wrote the Gospel afterwards. It's an interesting theory. I don't know whether it's true or not, but it's an interesting theory. But what it tells us is we can't read either book without remembering what happens in the other, and the details are important. So it is in the Gospel of St. Luke that we first meet the Blessed Virgin Mary. And I hope you will all know that story. The Mother of God was minding her own business when the angel Gabriel showed up. And isn't that the case with all of us? We're minding our own business when God shows up and just kind of messes everything up. That's what happened here. She was getting married, everything was done, the invitations had gone out, the caterer had been called, all that kind of stuff, and God shows up. 
and the whole story takes a huge shift in another direction. And here is part of what the archangel says to her. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy and will be called Son of God. We know those words because they're recited every year by some petrified child during the Christmas pageant. <laughs> what is happening here with the Blessed Virgin Mary is no less than a little Pentecost, a prefiguring of that day when the church in all its fullness will be revealed. The church is being revealed in her because the mother of God is at this stage the embodiment of the emerging revealed church. And this is a promise in this moment of what is yet to come. So how is this? How is this? How is it all related? We remember two important things about the Annunciation, about this moment when the Archangel Gabriel appears to the Blessed Virgin Mary. The first is this. In inviting the Blessed Virgin Mary to become the Mother of God, God invites her into a unique, personal, and eternal relationship. There is no other relationship between anyone and God of the kind that God has with her. But while this relationship is unique, personal, and eternal, it is not private to her. She cannot keep this relationship to herself. It is not, in fact, for her. This unique, personal, and eternal relationship between the Father and the Mother of God is for the salvation of the world. And the second thing that we learn is that in becoming the mother of God, the Blessed Virgin Mary finds her true fulfillment as a human person. She finds her eternal uniqueness in this deep personal relationship with God in which she does something that nobody else can do. She gives of her own flesh so that God may be born among us. And so she shows to us that each of us, in responding to God, in responding to God's invitation that, to all of us, that we too may have a relationship with God that is unique, eternal, and personal, that we too may become God's dwelling place, and by becoming God's dwelling place, we may have the capacity to be God-bearers ourselves so that we can make God real for others. That is the deep message of the Annunciation. It isn't just about Mary and God. It is about you and me too. Because she is cooperating with God in exactly the same way that you and I are expected to cooperate with God by virtue of our baptism. That's the commitment that we make. We become God's dwelling place at our baptism as a matter of actual fact. God renews his life in us every time we receive God into ourselves in this Eucharist that we are celebrating this morning. At every Eucharist, there is a little Pentecost, because at the Eucharist, there is bread and wine, and there are you and me, and we are overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and changed, so that this lifeless bread and wine may become the life-giving body and blood of Christ, and so that we may become God-bearers to make God real for others, so that we may become, as the liturgy so it clearly says, the body of Christ to do the work of Jesus 
that he has given us to do. We too, like the Blessed Virgin Mary, are invited to give God flesh in our own time so that others may have a physical, concrete assurance by our words and actions of God's love for them. And now on this Feast of Pentecost, we begin to see the connection. Here again, God comes everywhere present and filling all things, as an ancient prayer puts it. And just as God overshadowed the mother of God at the Annunciation, God overshadows the disciples and those present at the moment of Pentecost. And the same thing happened to them that happened to the Blessed Virgin Mary at the Annunciation. They were each brought into a unique personal and eternal relationship, and at last, at last, because they hadn't found it before, you'll notice that they all fled and left Jesus in a lurch. So, they hadn't found and understood their unique, eternal, and personal relationship with God, even up to the time of Jesus' death. It's here, it's here, that it was all made clear. The disciples and the others in the group find their true fulfillment as those who are now able to see themselves as God-bearers, who are called to make God's good news hearable by everyone. And they were able to give birth to God in the ministry of the church, and almost all of them died in that service. One, by tradition, died in his bed. The rest of them were killed for their newfound faith and commitment. And so this moment of the sacrament of confirmation and indeed of reception and the renewal of baptismal vows is an affirmation of all of this, of the opening of a new relationship that the Annunciation makes clear of the overshadowing of Pentecost, of which we are all the heirs. Those who are being confirmed, as well as those who have been confirmed before and are being received into the Episcopal Church and who are reaffirming your baptismal covenant today, have already received the gift of God's sustaining spirit at baptism. Let's not forget, baptism is the moment in which we receive God's spirit. Everybody gets it, without exception. Everybody gets it. There isn't, there isn't a subsequent time when God gives some things to people because he thinks they're special. We get the same gift equally at baptism. We get the same gift of the Spirit equally in baptism. Already, these candidates have been brought into a unique, personal, and eternal relationship with God. Today, as we celebrate Pentecost, as we celebrate this sacrament, this gift that you have already been given is revealed and strengthened for what it is, the way to true fulfillment and the way of making God real for others. The mother of God was a person just like you and me, and this is the point. Real people can be God-bearers, real people can make God real for others. That's the point. That's why she's there in the midst of the disciples at Pentecost, to be a living witness of the fact that they can do what she has already been doing. It is as persons that we are called into the life of the church in which we are given at our baptism the capacity to live that unique personal and eternal relationship with God that is God's gift to each one of us. At Pentecost, all this hidden work is made manifest so that we can see that we can only be Christians together and so that we can know that the life we are given in God's Spirit is not for us and for our personal benefit or gain. It is for the life of the world, just as it was for the disciples in company with the Mother of God at that first Pentecost in Jerusalem.